Good morning. I'm Thad Altman, president of the Astronaut Memorial Foundation. Welcome to the Space Mirror. This majestic structure, standing 42 feet tall and 50 feet wide, made of mirror polished granite, was designated by Congress to be a national memorial to honor those astronauts who've made the ultimate sacrifice. It's very fitting that we here, gather here today to honor all of the 24 astronauts on the date of the 24th, uh, the date of the 10th anniversary of the Columbia accident. Today we celebrate those who have sacrificed to improve and empower our world with deeds recognized for commitment and courage. But to truly honor these men and women requires something more, something more from all of us, that we carry and make their mission ours for the good of mankind. As we begin our ceremony, please rise for the presentation of the colors by the Patrick Air Force Base Guard, followed by the national anthem sung by B.B. Winans. So proudly we hailed at the twilight's last gleam, whose broad stripes and bright stars.
Wow. Thank you, Bibi. That was inspirational. We will begin today's program with an invocation presented by the Chairman of the AMF Board of Trustees, Dr. Mick Euclea. You may be seated. Our presence here today is simply a small reflection of the world's recognition and appreciation for the selfless service of seven men and women <clears throat> who lost their lives in the Columbia accident. Their accomplishments were great and they will continue to impact every human being on the face of this earth, but I think even more importantly is the spirit in which they served, which motivates us to maximize our own potential and use that in service to others as well. Would you join me in prayer? Lord, on this day we remember and celebrate the lives of seven brave men and women who have moved us to excel in so many ways. We remember their qualities, the tenacity, the commitment, the courage, their conviction, and yes, their humility, not only in their personal lives, but their professional lives as well. Our Father, we acknowledge their families and the great sacrifice of releasing their loved ones to serve in such an intense profession in the hopes of bettering mankind, and even the greater sacrifice of losing those they love so dearly. The example of these seven strong individuals, so relevant, so inspirational, and we memorialize their service, and yet their voice is very much alive and is still making a difference even today. Their risks and their service were obvious. They accepted those risks along with the promise of a better life so, Father, we honor them today as ones whose selfless sacrifice model for us life at its highest level. We're reminded by you that you do not forget, and so neither do we. We will keep their voice alive and active in teaching this current and future generations. So, Father, be with us today as we honor these servant leaders and continue to extend your grace to each one of us. Amen. On this 10th anniversary of the Columbia accident, we are honored to have with us our own board of directors for the Astronaut Memorial Foundation, astronauts, government officials, and NASA officials. Before we begin our ceremony, I'd like to acknowledge a few of these special guests. Please hold your applause until we finish introducing those. Susan Fernandez, representing Senator Marco Rubio, a close friend of AMF and, a spa and the space community. Todd Sykes, regional director for the Florida State Chief Financial o Officer, Jeff Atwater, Commander of the 45th Space Wing, General Anthony Cotton, and Chief Master Sergeant Herman Moyer, former Center Director Bill Parsons, past presidents or chairman of the Astronaut Memorial Foundation Board of Directors, Alan Hellman, Lee Solid, Stephen Feldman, President of Space Florida, Frank DeBello, and a special guest, Jim Kuzma, who's the COO of Space Florida. Jim was a classmate of the pilot of Columbia, Willie McCool, at the U.S. Uh, Naval Academy. It's good to have you here. Dr. Anthony Cantonese, president of the Florida Institute of Technology, and with FIT, we have seven students. Florida Tech named seven of its dorms, its new Columbia Village, after each one of the Columbia accidents. We have those seven students here with us, each, each student representing each individual dorm named after a Columbia astronaut. We also have 44 students and three teachers from Ilan Ramon's hometown in Israel. I think they win the award for being, having traveled the longest to get here. Thank you for being here. Chief Operating Officer of Delaware North, Bill Moore, as well as former astronauts Eileen Collins, John McBride, Bob Cabana, Bob Springer, and Winston Scott. Finally, and most importantly, I would like to also acknowledge the family members who have taken their time and to join us here at this special place. They have a very special place in our heart, hearts. Evelyn Husband Thompson, the widow of the Columbia Commander Rick Husband, Sandra Anderson, widow of Columbia Payload Commander Michael Anderson, Laura and Matthew Husband, the children of Columbia Commander Rick Husband and Evelyn Husband Thompson, Roger Pervinus, grandson of Roger Chaffee, and other members of the Chaffee family, uh, 
Deborah Kesterling and Dale Young, and of course Robert Roger Chaffee having perished on the Apollo 1 pad fire. Thank all of you for joining us today, and I'd like to introduce the chairman of the AMF board, a wonderful person who's a joy to work with, is former astronaut John McBride. John is the only astronaut to have flown in space from West Virginia. Uh, we have a beautiful, the nation of West Virginia, he mentions. <laughs> and he has a NASA center named after him. It's a beautiful facility, I've seen it. It's the software testing and research laboratory. Uh, it is a, it's almost heaven there, John. Uh, John was pilot of STS-41G and was scheduled to fly the next uh, mission in March of 1986 as the commander of STS-61E. This flight was one of several flights deferred by NASA in the wake of the Challenger accident in January of 1986. And if those of you who were here, it was a day very much like today. We cl hold those uh, astronauts close to our hearts. John? Thank you, Thad. Uh, what a day. Thank you, God, for this beautiful weather. And thank all, each and every one of you for coming out here today. I want to thank you, Thad, for all the professionalism that you've shown us here in the last uh, few weeks as we, as we put this program together. So thanks to you. It's been a pleasure for me to work with you during the first six months of his administration as the new president of AMF. With us is his predecessor, Dr. Stephen Feldman, who I had the pleasure of working with, too. So thank you for laying the groundwork for all the things that we're doing. He's, he's had several of these. This is Thad's first. So. So thank you for being here. Uh, I also want to thank, thank Kathy. Where's Kathy Gray? I'll tell you what, we couldn't do this without Kathy. So thank you very much for doing all your, your hard work in the background, all the folks at AMF. First of all, I uh, thank you, the students from FIT, for coming up here. Thank you, Dr. Catanese, for bringing them with us. So this is really about the, the youth. So there's a youth element in the thread of this whole thing we're doing here today. Where are my friends from Israel? Back here somewhere, can I see you? Boker Tov. I spent almost two years in Israel. There's only six people that speak Hebrew, and I'm, I kind of understand the language, so we're glad to have you here. Mashlam Kar, Mashlam Mer. Huh? Boker Tov. I see him back there. Toda Raba. Shabbat Shalom. And Liter Oat. Okay? Oh, thank you for bearing with me. Uh, so we welcome the youngsters here today, and also uh, I get asked a lot during my career over the last uh, several years. John, if you could go back at least to 1978 when you joined NASA in that first class of astronauts, what would you change? And uh, I have to think a while, but obviously if I had the power and the strength to, to reverse uh, the tragedy we've had since 1978, erase these names from this board, obviously that's be, that would be my first choice. I don't have that power. None of us have that power. There's only one higher being that has the power to do things like that. But I'll tell you what, and I, I'll guarantee you that I think if I had my seven dear friends, including classmates of mine here on my left from Challenger, and the seven members from Columbia here on my right, and anybody in this audience or on the web or on the network here today wanted to know if any of us would go back and do it again, I'll guarantee you there would be 15 hands in the air mine and theirs. That's because that's how strongly we believe in what we do and why we do it. And it's for these young folks that came here today primarily. We want them to be inspired by the folks like Eileen Collins and Bob Cabana and the folks we lost on these two tragic missions so that they'll follow in our footsteps like we got to follow in Alan Shepard and Gus Grissom, Neil Armstrong and all those guys that came before us. So. It's to the youth that we dedicate a lot of this uh, actions we're doing here today. So having said that, I would like to introduce our first speaker today, a very special lady, the widow of Rick Husband. Uh, she's written a book called Higher Calling, Calling, which really attests to the testament and the spirit, the dedication of her husband, Rick, who was a commander of... Uh, 107, the loss of Columbia 10 years ago today. So, Evelyn Husband Thompson, would you come and say a few words to us, please? Good morning. First of all, I would like to thank the Astronaut Memorial Foundation for honoring and memorializing the crew of STS 107 
who sacrificed their lives in pursuit of space exploration 10 years ago this very morning. Although they've already been introduced, I want to um, say a special welcome again to the family members that are here today, first of all. My husband, Bill, my son, Matthew, my daughter, Laura, and my dear friend, Sandy, Sandra. <laughs> today we gather to honor and remember the special crew of Columbia who are regarded as national heroes, and we are not alone. Today in Israel, family members, friends, and NASA colleagues are gathered to remember the crew. In East Texas this morning, where Columbia and her crew found their final resting place. Tributes are being made and memorial services today are being conducted by Columbia family members, friends, and lots of NASA folks. For many of us gathered here in Florida today, this commemoration is, is not only historic, it's, it's also very personal. We remember the Columbia crew as colleagues, as friends, as parents, and as spouses. My husband, Rick, was the commander of STS-107. I will talk a bit ab more about him shortly. But he was a kind and he was a good leader who was determined to see each crew member enjoy their full potential during the mission. Willie was fun-loving and cheerful, soft-spoken and hardworking. As a commander in the Navy, he was good at everything he did, and Rick was very happy to share the cockpit with him as pilot. He loved his wife, Lonnie, intensely, and their three sons. KC was absolutely brilliant with a doctorate in aerospace engineering, and she was very friendly, sometimes not an easy combination. She was thorough and detailed, yet she greatly enjoyed nature and spending time with her husband, JP, her many friends, and her family. She had the gift of hospitality and made everyone feel welcome in her home. Laurel was a doctor, a captain in the Navy, and a mom. She had a sunny disposition and a desk area that was filled with flowers. She was always ready with a kind word and a smile. She loved her family tremendously and included her son everywhere possible in her training. Mike had a smile that lit up the room. He and his wife, Sandra, were very close friends to Rick and I. He was a lieutenant colonel in the Air Force and the payload commander. His competency was tremendous. Mike was the father of two beautiful girls. His Christian faith was very important to him and was manifested in a quiet confidence that was highly respected. Dave was a super achiever. He was a captain in the Navy, a medical doctor, a pilot, a gymnast, <laughs> including being an acrobat, unicyclist, and a stilt walker for a circus while he was in college, seriously. He was also a videographer, and he filmed the crew during training and their flight. He loved his family and his dog, Duggins, dearly, and they meant the world to him. Elon was a tremendously gifted pilot and a colonel in the Israeli Air Force. He served as the payload specialist. He managed to balance a serious attention to detail with a very playful side. He humbly understood his unique place in history as Israel's first astronaut, and he was keenly aware of the significance of items that he flew in space, each with a profound story. He adored his wife and four children. He and his family blessed all of us with teaching us Jewish traditions and serving us extremely delicious food. <laughs> Just as NASA has pursued lessons learned from the tragedies listed behind me on the space mirror, we have all had personal journeys to walk. There have been lessons learned from all of our experiences as well. For a brief few minutes, please allow me to share some thoughts and insights from the past 10 years. The night before they flew, we said our goodbyes, and Rick talked to the crew and to the spouses. He shared a little bit about his faith and its importance to him in his life, and he quoted a passage first out of Joshua 1, 6 through 9. It concludes with, have I not commanded you? Be strong and courageous. Do not be terrified. Do not be discouraged, for the Lord your God will be with you 
wherever you go. Columbia's 16-day mission in space accomplished over 80 experiments by the crew on a 24-7 schedule. They worked so well together. The mission was a tremendous success with great results being obtained throughout the mission. Our families were very proud of the crew and arrived here in Florida the evening before the landing day. We all shared a meal together at a local restaurant. I went to bed with the NASA channel left on quietly in the background and I fell asleep, thanking God for the great mission. And I was so excited for the reunion with my husband. That morning, we woke up early and quickly prepared to head to the landing site. Before departing the hotel, my children each watched their recorded video that Rick had made for them to view each day that he was in space. He read devotionals to them, talked to them about his faith, and he prayed with them. He also warned them that the weather wasn't just right. They might have to stay in orbit a day or two longer, but he reassured them that it wouldn't be too long before we would all be reunited. February 1st, 2003 became a traumatic, shocking day. Anticipating a joyful homecoming of our crew, we were jolted in the viewing area into a nightmarish stroll of fear, uncertainty, and, and horror that led to a crushing announcement that the crew had perished during reentry. Words of sorrow, efforts to comfort, even fathoming the magnitude of loss was overwhelming that day. Looks of disbelief from one family member to another brought little comfort. The shock was so intense that even tears were not freely able to fall. They would come in the weeks, months, and years to follow in waves and in buckets. Rick and I shared together a belief in Jesus Christ. Rick was not one to proselytize those around him, but his actions and words revealed a devout Christ follower. His favorite verse that he signed on his astronaut pictures was Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. Trust in the Lord with all your heart, and do not lean on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him, and he will direct your paths. That morning, I clearly remember looking at the sky in disbelief that my beloved was not going to pop through a thin layer of clouds any moment and remove the panic and the fear that was rising in my heart. I needed to trust, even though no one understood what was happening. In the middle of all that, we didn't know. All that I didn't know, I knew that God was sovereign, meaning that he's in control. Had Rick and his crew really given the ultimate sacrifice? As moments rolled into days and days into years, the grief journey has been difficult, complicated, and surprising. It has been a front row viewing, rubber meets the road experience. The sorrow and impact of the tragedy of all of our families has been extreme. But just as a forest fire reduces beautiful foliage into ashes, those ashes ultimately become nourishment for new, healthy growth. There are indeed small green shoots of hope that are springing up in our lives. The human spirit, created by God, began to minister to my family. The determination of the folks in East Texas to do it right and to do it with honor was a reflection of the best of the best as they tackled the tsunami of accident debris over hundreds of miles and accommodated the invasion of the thousands who came to help with the recovery process. Their graciousness and hospitality will be forever appreciated and remembered. Friends and family cared for us, and countless thousands of others prayed for us. To all of you, I want to say thank you. Our hearts were devastated, wounded. Psalm 147.3 says that God heals the brokenhearted and binds up their wounds. It takes time to heal, lots of time, but healing is possible. I mentioned earlier that the journey has been difficult, complicated, and surprising. Sudden loss triggers a tidal wave of reaction that seems to take a lifetime to untangle and to resolve. But I have personally been really surprised with blessings that come from such hardship. The Old Testament book of Isaiah talks in chapter 61 about those who grieve, 
receiving a crown of beauty instead of ashes, the oil of joy instead of mourning, and a garment of praise instead of a spirit of despair. Beauty from ashes is a walk away from death into life. It is experiencing joy pouring over you, replacing the chokehold of grief. And it is the Lord filling our hearts with praise instead of devastation and sorrow. For some, the beauty has become a desire to continue the visions our crew embraced. Some have pursued quality and strong educational opportunities for future generations that will produce scientists and engineers and explorers that will benefit all of mankind. Multiple scholarships, schools, exhibits, museums, endowment funds, and archives have been dedicated in the Columbia Crew's memory. Every time I fly into my hometown of Amarillo, Texas, I land at the Rick Husband International Airport. I spend some quiet time with the Lord at our local E.A. Smith YMCA chapel in Houston, dedicated now to the Columbia Crew. Beauty from ashes, joy instead of mourning, praise instead of despair. As Rick shared with the crew and their spouses in an intimate setting the night before launch, the Lord your God will be with you wherever you go. Found in Joshua 1.9, and that's a promise that he relied on, our family has relied on, and that we rejoice in on behalf of all of those who are so graciously gathered here and around the world today for this occasion. God bless the families of STS 107. May our broken hearts continue to heal, and may beauty continue to replace the ashes. God bless you. Thank you. Thank you, Evelyn. Uh, we've got a young man here. Uh, his name is Kyle Breeze, who uh, had an uncle work there at NASA, and he was walking with his uncle one day and said, I wrote a song about the Columbia. And his uncle got a hold of Thad and myself and asked us if we would listen to this song and see what we thought. And uh, we listened to it and thought it was very appropriate. It's uh, written by Kyle, and he's going to be, the song is going to be sung by Joey Beasley. And Kyle will kind of back him up on the keyboard. BB, before we go any further, thank you, my friend. It was a, my heart about jumped out of my chest. Mm. Uh, so, Kyle, if you enjoy, you would please come up here and perform uh, 16 Minutes from Home. Thank you. How can we find what's been lost? Retrace this, find out the Just 
Thank you, Kyle. Thank you, Joey. We really do appreciate that. Uh, the next person I have the privilege of introducing hardly needs any introduction at all. Uh, as a matter of fact, she, not, she might not remember this, but back in the early 90s during her first flight, I used to get a daily phone call from, I think, Corning newspaper up in New York and tell us what you think Eileen's doing today. So I had flown just a few years earlier and I was recounting every step that the pilot would be doing during that mission every day. And so it was kind of how I got to know her so repetitiously, uh, never really having met her till just the last few years, but she's a great lady. Uh, she'll be inducted into our Astronaut Hall of Fame this year. She's the first American woman to pilot and command the space shuttle. Please welcome Colonel Eileen Collins. Well, good morning. And thank you, Kyle and Joey. Very nice. And thank you, Evelyn, for those beautiful remarks. And also thank you, uh, Thad and John and Steve Feldman, for inviting me to be here today. Usually when someone asks me, I'd say, well, let me go check my schedule and see if I, I can attend the event. But in this case, I told him yes on the spot. I wouldn't miss being here. Today is a day of remembrance. We remember the astronauts who took the daring step of accepting the challenge of spaceflight. And for the Columbia crew, their mission was a fulfillment of their dreams, to have an adventure, to visit microgravity, to live and work in a new and unusual environment, and to experience a feeling that you can't possibly simulate on the surface. It's a type of freedom to look down on our beautiful planet and to push hard to achieve the mission goals and to be part of a team with a meaningful vision. That vision is understanding the universe that we live in, the human body, the possibilities of new technologies, the Earth's natural processes, the secrets of nearby planets, and the universe beyond. The Columbia crew was taking baby steps, but great missions begin with baby steps, small steps, learning steps. They were passionate about this mission, 
they knew that passion and risk are part of any great mission. I'd like to share a personal brief reflection of each of the Columbia astronauts from my personal time with them. It's difficult for us that they're not physically here with us, but our memories are still strong. I remember Rick, who had such a beautiful singing voice. The first time I heard him sing was at Patty Robertson's memorial service at Ellington Field. His voice was so powerful and beautiful and memorable. I remember the day that Willie stopped in my office to show me his son's artwork. He was so proud of his children. I remember the times that Laurel and I talked about what it was like to be a mom and an astronaut. Casey and I worked together in the simulator trying to solve the sneaky problems that the instructors and the training team presented to us. And she had such a calm and logical way about her. Elon twice asked me to fly with him in the T-38. And that was such an honor. I really wish I had gotten to know him better. It was such a blessing to have him here. Dave was an optimist. While working together on a difficult problem in a project we were both assigned to, I observed that Dave was a man of ideas and solutions. And Mike was always so cool and calm. I don't think anything bothered him. And he always had a big smile on his face when he walked out to fly the T-38. Each of these memories and many more of them stay with me. And I hope that you too will keep your memories strong. This crew and astronauts in general have an understandable characteristic. Astronauts love to explore. And they feel, we feel, very confident, focused, and determined about it. Astronauts want adventure. I don't think that'll change. I often tell my children what my parents told me. Generations pass and centuries pass, but people don't change. I think, really, it seems to me that the sense of curiosity in people doesn't change. We still have it. Sure, the environment changes, technology changes, but people are still human. We still carry the spirit and the adventure of the people that we read about in history. For example, in the Bible, in the Greek plays, the discoveries made by Columbus and other explorers, and the people who populated and founded the Americas. I, I often laugh that sometime I seem to be turning into my mother. <laughs> And so I believe that exploring and risk-taking will be around for a long time, regardless of what you might read otherwise. And it's also important that I make a few comments about the space shuttle, which was an amazing and versatile ship. Despite its tragedies, its successes are also a part of history. The shuttle was an engineering wonder. My respect and thanks go out to those who designed and built it operated and maintained it. The shuttle was a test program, but it achieved its ultimate goal, the International Space Station. We learned from the shuttle and how the shuttle interacted with its environment. What we learned has led to new designs in spacecraft, which are safer and less expensive. We've also learned much on the shuttle about the human body, new technologies, our planet Earth, and deep space. Expensive satellites like Hubble and Chandra had astronauts nearby to fix potential problems that might develop before they were deployed into their orbits. We've come to live and work very well with other countries on many different levels. And we have inspired over 30 years of school children to study math and science. People of very diverse backgrounds came together on the shuttle missions. Our Columbia crew was one of diversity. We can relate to them. Their lives were exciting and dramatic. It takes your breath away to think about what they have done in their lives. They are adventurers, explorers, and role models. How fortunate they were to have had the experience to, the opportunity to experience a whole new world. 
To our friends from Mission STS 107, here we are 10 years later. We still love you. We still miss you. How can we ever thank you for your contributions to the great journey of human discovery? Proverbs 3, verse 5. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. Thank you, Eileen. Uh, there's some good and bad about being around a space program for 35 years. I guess the good part is I've been around for 35 years. Uh, the bad part is that I've been about, around for 35 years. But it's been a wonderful ride for me, and got a lot of folks, uh, when you've been around that long, you, I recognize just about everybody in the audience and certainly most of the people here on the stage. And the next gentleman I have the opportunity to introduce is no stranger to space either. He's been around just a little bit less than I have, but everybody knows this gentleman. He uh, was Deputy Director of Johnson Space Center, Director of the Space Center up in uh, Stennis, and now he's our current director here at the Kennedy Space Center, second astronaut to do that. He flew four times in space as twice as commander. He's just an outstanding man who's also a member of our Astronaut Hall of Fame. Without further ado, Bob Cabana. Come on up, please, sir. Thank you, John. Uh, good morning, everyone. Sandy, uh, Evelyn, Eileen, it's so good to see so many friends. Uh, Ten years ago this morning, uh, I was the director of flight crew operations standing out at the middle of the shuttle landing facility waiting for a spaceship to come home to Florida with seven of my friends on board. But they never came home, and soon it became very obvious that something very bad had happened. And that was the beginning of a very difficult time for their families, their friends, the shuttle program, and our agency. Many tears were shed. The nation mourned their loss, and then we got about the business of picking up the pieces, correcting our deficiencies, and continuing our quest to explore, ensuring that their loss was not in vain. In looking back, uh, there was no malicious intent by any engineer or manager in the decisions they made that led to the loss of Columbia and her crew. They were doing their very best to be successful. But we are human. And oftentimes, when lacking sufficient data, we make poor decisions. And that results in events like Apollo 1, Challenger, and Columbia. I've always felt that the true measure of a person is not in the mistakes that he or she makes, but in how they respond to those mistakes. Do they allow them to drag them down? Or did they rise above them and go on to even greater accomplishments? I believe we have learned from ours. We have risen above them, and we are going on to even greater accomplishments. But we must never forget the hard lessons that we've learned in the past. It's important that we pause to remember and reflect. We must do our very best to prevent something like that from ever happening again. Too much is at stake. So thank you, Rick, Willie, Mike, Kalpna, Dave, Laurel, and Ilan for your sacrifice. We promise to continue your thirst for knowledge, to learn from our mistakes, to rise above our failings, and to one day lead the way beyond our home planet in our never-ending quest to explore. We remember, and we will never forget. Thank you. Thank you, Bob. Uh, next gentleman goes back a ways, too. You know, it seems like we, we all know each other here. And uh, William H. Gerstenmeyer is Associate Administrator up in our headquarters office up in Washington, D.C., uh, for humans operations, human space flight operations. Uh, Gersty, as we call him, and I and Bob and all of us go back a long ways. As a matter of fact, he was a flight controller on my mission back in the early days of the space shuttle program. So without further ado, William H. Gerstenmeyer. Gersty, would you come up and say a few words to us, please? Thank you, sir. Thank you, John, and 
thank you all for the wonderful words that we've heard this morning and the thoughts. It's my honor to be here today to speak to you on behalf of everyone who works in the endeavor of human spaceflight. The teams that I represent uh, recognize that it's a special privilege to do the work of pioneering new frontiers in the solar system. Flying people in space is a tremendous responsibility. As an agency and a family, NASA has been part of some of the greatest accomplishments in human achievement. But attaining these achievements has also reminded us that our work does not come without tremendous risk and tragedy. Our failures are cause for reflection. Today's anniversary of Columbia, like the anniversaries of Apollo 1 and Challenger last week, are a call to rededicate ourselves to the mission to which so many of us have given so much and a few have given all. I'd like each of you to reflect today in three different ways and reflect personally of your own thoughts. First, remember where you were 10 years ago. 10 years ago, there were two Americans and a Russian living on a half-finished International Space Station with parts from 15 countries still on the ground awaiting a ride on the space shuttle. As the International Space Station program manager, it was my job to call the international partners and let them know we had a problem. Those of us in the space station program had to separate ourselves from the tragedy that affected many of us deeply in personal ways and make sure that our crew on the space station would be safe. I'd also like you to think about what we've learned and can still learn from the lessons of a decade ago. The accident wasn't caused by a single event or a single person, but by a series of technical and cultural missteps stemming all the way back to the first shuttle launch in 1981, when ice and foam first struck the orbital maneuvering system Ohm's pods. This was the first indication we had a design problem. But we continued to fly without fully investigating the consequences of foam hitting the orbiter. We continued to lose foam on many missions, and this reinforced the idea that all was well. We did not stay hungry, and we didn't deeply analyze the implications of foam being released at precisely the wrong moment. We continued our work on the space station and to build the next generation of spacecraft. As we do these things, we need to stay vigilant and recognize that even the smallest potential flaw can become a big problem. We need to keep asking questions and looking beyond that initial close call. We need to learn from these seemingly small, inconsequential events. In the honor of the Columbia crew, it is our job to be aware of the technical subtleties and be creative about understanding them and the underlying problems. Even small problems can surface as major failures. Lastly, I'd, I also want you to think about how we can ensure that this accident changes us in ways that pays tribute to the sacrifice of the Columbia's crews. One of the legacies rooted in a tragedy of 10 years ago is the space station itself, beautifully orbiting our planet, completed safely thanks to the hard lessons we've learned throughout NASA's history. We, continue building the we continued building the space station with the memory of the Columbia crew in our minds, their mission was one of pure science, and we are carrying that legacy of science forward. Ten years ago, it would have been easy to pull back from the frontier of space and say it was too risky to pursue. Instead, we rededicated ourselves to improving how we pushed the boundaries of space exploration, and we vowed to continue with our eyes open. We cannot be afraid of risk, and we cannot be ignorant of it either. Our lasting tribute to those we have lost is to carry on with the cause of, that they believed was worth, the ultimate sacrifice. It is our mission today as it was theirs. Thank you. Thank you, Gersti. And our uh, final speaker we'll hear from today came to us from Washington, D.C. today. Mr. Robert Lightfoot came down. He's our one of our senior guys up there, the associate administrator to Charlie Bolden in Washington, D.C. He was the uh, director of the Marshall Space Flight Center, and I guess back in 2003, for a couple of years, he did the return to flight oversight. So, Robert, would you say a few words to us, sir? 
Thank you, John, and, and thank you to the Columbia family for being here. It's great to have you here and great remarks, Evelyn. Thank you so much for sharing those with us. Today is a very meaningful day for the NASA family. Ten years ago, many of us here on the front lines of the space shuttle program, maybe even as we've, as we've heard at the landing site awaiting Columbia's return, realized the extent of the tragedy and that we knew the world would never be the same again for us. This time each year, we remember and honor the Columbia crew and all those who've lost their lives in this great endeavor of space exploration. The Challenger crew, Apollo 1, Mike Adams, the X-15 pilot. These brave men and women and their families have our deepest gratitude. We work every day to build on that legacy and to infuse the life and vitality that they, had, that they shared with us into the work that we do as we move for, forward. It was an honor for me to stand aside the team as we began to recover from the Columbia accident. What I saw was a dedicated, focused team pushing hard, a team completely devastated by the loss, but completely resolved to getting us back to flying again with the memory of the crew right in front of us every day. It will go down for me personally as the most gratifying time of my career to see that team come together to pull us back from such a tragedy. The emotions of seeing the shuttle leave off the pad with Eileen Collins at command, they return to flight, it's hard to explain. The congruence of the hard work to get there, the memory of the Columbia crew, and then the dream realized of flying again, all bundled up in one amazing moment. We not only returned to flight after Columbia, we established better policies, better procedures, and worked on our culture to ensure this wasn't going to happen again. All because the legacy of this crew and their dedication to space exploration. In the years after we returned to flight, we completed the engineering marvel that Gerst talked about, this International Space Station flying above us today. An unparalleled and unique orbiting laboratory that's going to return amazing things for us for years to come. NASA Administrator Charlie Bolden just attended the Elan Ramon Sym Symposium in Israel, where he, where he celebrated the life of Elan and extended again our dedication to international partnership in this journey of space exploration. I believe we flew out the remainder of the shuttle program safely based on the lessons we learned and based on our complete and total commitment to making sure it didn't happen again. I heard many people say, and I believe it because I was there with them, that the last flight was the safest flight we ever flew because of what the team did. Now the shuttles have completed their missions, and they will inspire millions of folks as they sit in museums and science centers around the country, including right here in, at, in Florida. They'll ignite a spark in that next generation of explorers that we, that we hope come along behind us, some of them perhaps back here today in the crowd. But what we want to do is we want to make sure that that next generation knows the legacy that's there. So while this is NASA's day of remembrance, in part a time of sadness, it's also a time of reflection, time to reflect on what we can do better and how we can move on and move forward. So we call it a day of remembrance, but what I hope you will all do is commit to remembering every day the legacy and the memory of the Columbia crew and all those that came before them as we continue this tremendous journey of exploration. Thank you. Wow. Thank you, Robert. That's perfect timing because we have a very special treat for you. Uh, we've got uh, several of our astronauts who flew down from Houston, and they're going to fly right overhead here in about 10 seconds. How was that for timing? <laughs> Thank you, Robert. I... Uh, Thad, do you want to introduce our special guest one more time? Human exploration inspires. Inspires us to be Americans. It inspires us to work and be productive. It inspires us in music and film and art. It really, really contributes to the quality of life. It's a part of our nature as human beings. B.B. Winans is a six-time Grammy Award winning 
winner. He resides in Nashville, and he could write an album or a song about anything he wanted to. But his latest album, America, America, is about America and what it means to be America. And his song, Ultimate Sacrifice, is inspired by those who have given the ultimate sacrifice and service of our country. It's a fitting song to honor the astronauts who have given their lives for human spaceflight. Maybe a remarkable thing happened as I was walking over to the memorial this morning. Sandra, Sandra Anderson and I were talking. Turned out to be that Columbia Payload Commander Michael Anderson was a huge Winans fan. 16 minutes from home, the shuttle of Columbia broke up over the state of Texas. A thousand miles away, but only 16 minutes from home. And then as all those folks who went out there to help pick up the pieces and to figure out what happened, they found certain personal items that made it to Earth. And one was an album, a CD, that Michael Anderson took and flew on the Columbia. It was a Winans Island. It was, it was CeCe's album. And Sandra still has that album. And now 10 years later, Sandra's sitting next to B.B. Winans. B.B. B.B. Winans, Ultimate Sacrifice. Thank you for being here, B.B., and thank you for, for helping us remember those very special astronauts. Wow, you should have told me that afterwards. <laughs> I'm messed up now. <laughs> wow. You know, I, I, as I sat there, I, I um, confirmed within myself that it's a calling that astronauts have. It's a calling that we all have in our lives to do what we were called to do. And I knew at a young age that my calling was to sing and to write songs. Um, I never even faked being an astronaut because I knew that was not what God called me to do. But I, I honor you today. I really do honor the families and those who have given the ultimate sacrifice. I was in um, Kuwait singing for our troops when this song was inspired by a young man who gave me a, a, a piece of paper and said, read this when you get home. And when I got home, I read it, and it was, he asked me to call his mother and tell his mother that I saw him and he was okay. He was her only child. And not knowing what the future held for that young man. I wrote this song, and today I dedicate it to the families and to those who paid the ultimate sacrifice. And Thad, thank you for inviting me. Mm -hmm. Can you bring the mic up a little more? And the music. So far away, away from home, uncertainty is all we've known. Thinking about you, I say a prayer over and over. I want you to know how much I care. And how can I say thank you? How can I let you know the way I feel about you? Certainly a hero. Just wanted to say thank you. Though it may have cost your life, did you ever once think twice? Yet willing to make the ultimate sacrifice. Days and nights you were afraid. Convince your heart, be strong and brave. We're not here to judge who's right, who's wrong. 
but from my heart I I sing this song just wanting to say thank you how can I let you know the way I feel about you certainly a hero just wanted to say thank you though it may have cost your life did you ever once think twice think twice yet willing to make the ultimate sacrifice yeah. men and women from different races all around this world come together united hand in hand oh. wipe the tears from all the faces of every girl and boy giving them the chance How can I let you know the way I feel about you? Certainly a hero just wanted to say thank you, though it is. to meet sacrifice oh just willing to make the ultimate sacrifice mm -hmm. thank you Thank you, sir. God bless. Thank you very much. Microphone? There we go. I would like for Evelyn, uh, Sandra, Gersty, and Bob, if you would, go down and pick up our wreath here at the front gate here and move it to the center. Once they've gotten that done, I would like to uh, close our program by reading the 24 names that you see on the you're behind you, and as I read them, please uh, uh, send a little bit of your love and energy to each and every one of these uh, folks that we honor today. I'll read the names, and we'll have a little moment of silence at the end. Theodore C. Freeman. Charles A. Bassett III, Elliot M. C. Jr., Clifton C. Williams, Jr., Virgil Gus Grissom, Edward H. White II, Roger B. Chaffee, Michael J. Adams, Robert H. Lawrence, Jr., Francis Dick Scobie, Michael J. Smith, Judith A. Resnick, Ellison S. Onizuka, Ronald E. McNair, Gregory B. Jarvis, S. Krista McAuliffe, Manley L. Sonny Carter, Jr., Rick D. Husband, William C. McCool, Michael P. Anderson, Kalpana Chawla, David M. Brown, Laurel Clark, and Ilan Ramon. Let's all please have a 30 second pause for a moment of silence.
Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for being with us this morning. This concludes our program.